can see that uh, shortly after the confinement transition. And she will be talking about neutron electric diaper moment with lattice QCD. So, Dina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea, uh, for the invitation uh, to present uh, this work. Um, I also apologize for not being able to be physically there, um, uh, but uh, at least it's a chance that I present this, uh, uh, these results. Um, okay, so what I will do uh, here in this talk is to... Um, uh, because of the audience, I would like to spend a little bit of time uh, to uh, explain um, where we are as far as far as VATISQCD simulations are concerned. And then uh, explain a little bit the approach um, to extract um, form factors. And I will first say, uh, show some results on quantities that are very well known like the electromagnetic form factors to convince you that we really know what we're doing and how that our methods work. And then of course, um, I will present our latest uh, results on the uh, electric dipole moment uh, of the neutron, um, which involve actually calculating the CP uh, odd form factor F3 and this is why this is, um, I mean, uh, discussing about the electromagnetic form factors um, is relevant uh, for what we are trying to do here. I will discuss the results and make some comparisons, and then I will conclude. Um, this work uh, is done in collaboration with Andreas, Kiriakos, Fajri, and Aku, um, and Antonino Tordandor. To, to and it's basically described in the, um, in the um, reference uh, given here. Right, so very, uh, very briefly, um, how do I calculate the non perturbative quantity uh, within La Discusity? Uh, Massimo uh, gave an excellent uh, introduction uh, so um, most of this uh, you have seen, but let me go very quickly over it. So we do a Feynman path integral over the gauge degrees of freedom, which are defined on links on the lattice. Um, uh, I have a certain operator uh, that I'm interested in, in evaluating. This operator may depend on the gauge degrees and the uh, fermionic uh, the quark propagator, which is the inverse of the Dirac matrix. Uh, and this is weighted by the um, uh, e to the minus s, uh, the um, action of QCD in terms of the gauge degrees of freedom. Uh, because uh, being a local uh, theory, um, which depends um, Quadratical in the in the fermionic fields, I can integrate them out, and I get the determinant of the fermionic uh, determinant. And in 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 the simulations that we do, uh, we consider the four lightest flavors: the U, the D, the S, and the charm. So the up, down, strange, and charm quarks, uh, because the other ones are very high and therefore uh, their effects in, in the quantities that we are, are discussing as more. So this is the kind of Feynman path integral we want to evaluate. And because it's the multi-dimensional integral, we need to uh, do it by our uh, Monte Carlo methods. Uh, and we use uh, for the simulation, very big machines. This, if you like, is our apparatus. Uh, uh, so we generate these gauge configurations uh, on uh, supercomputers. Examples are the IBM that sits in um, Germany, um, the dual supercomputer that sits also in Germany. Uh, these have specific architectures. They are optimal for the generation of these uh, gauge configurations. And after I have these gauge configurations, which are common actually for all observables, so that they don't depend on the observable O, they only depend on the action here. 
then I compute uh, the inverse of the fermionic matrix D uses maybe some other optimal architecture uh, that is um, equipped, a machine that is equipped with uh, graphic cards, uh, which are very good in computing inverse, inverses of very uh, big uh, matrices. Uh, so having the, uh, the uh, gauge fields and the uh, propagators, then I can in principle construct any observable and compute it non-perturbatively. Now we will be looking at the neutron. So I will, uh, we will be looking at the electromagnetic current traveling to the um, to a quark in the balance of, of the neutron. Now there are other contributions that I'm not going to discuss for this quantity here that enter, but we will ignore them for this talk. And then it's, it's, sorry, it's like I do, um, it's like an experiment. I have uh, many measurements and then I do a, 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 a careful analysis to ex extract certain properties uh, of my hadron. And in this particular case, it will be the neutral type of moment. Okay, now, these are our apparatus. Uh, these are very big machines that we use. Just for your reference, uh, that's where I'm sitting right now in Cyprus, a very small island in the Eastern Mediterranean. We do have uh, a local computer which we use, but it's a small one compared to the ones we usually do to do these computations. And you can see, and I acknowledge the computer time that we're getting on these machines. Uh, we, are, we use Marconi in Italy. Uh, we use Pinstein in Switzerland, uh, three machines in Germany, but also machines in the United States. So without these um, instruments, uh, large uh, QCD calculations are not possible. So this is what we need in order to do these uh, computations. And uh, you see praise here, the partnership of um, advanced computing in Europe uh, which enables any one of us sitting in Europe accessing uh, these machines. Okay, so what is the current status of the simulations globally? And here I'm showing you a plot of the simulations by various collaborations, um, plotted as a function of the lattice spacing and the pion mass. Now we all know, know the physical pion mass. The physical pion mass is 135 V, so it is dotted line here, dashed line here. But you see that uh, there are many points away from the physical uh, pion mass, which I call physical point. And this is because simulations and analysis were very hard to do um, for physical pion masses. Okay, so uh, a lot of the previous works were done using heavier physical pion masses. However, in the recent five years or so, you see many collaborations having uh, ensembles directly at the physical point, what I call physical mass point. And the uh, size of the circles reflects how big the volumes uh, that we use are, and you see a very big circle that indicates um, a, a, a very big um, volume. Of course, the simulations get harder and harder as we approach the continuum limit. Um, you see all, all simulations stop at about 0.05 Fermi, and there is a very good reason for this because then we enter what we call critical slowing down, and this is a major problem for, for the sim simulations. And I will say um, a few words later on uh, on this point. So you see um, uh, various collaborations here and uh, names. Um, and these are um, uh, distinguished by the way we discretize the, the fermionic part of the action. 
So as you know, I can discredit a theory in different ways. And depending on the ways I do it, um, each collaboration uh, picks its favor and then does the simulations. And of course, in the continuum limit, all these should agree. So you see many collaborations now are using recent type fermions. Uh, I belong to the extended twisted mass collaboration. It is the only collaboration using Wilson type fermions that can simulate the light tablet plus um, a strange uh, plus a charm. The rest you see here, they use uh, the light tablet, uh, UV uh, plus a strange. Of course, there are other uh, formulations, you just target fermions that do simulate, that do include the charm. And so these are called static fermions, and then there are the domain war fermions, which are very expensive, and they also use two plus one. So these are the major collaborations, so worldwide, uh, simulating these cage configurations, uh, which, as I said, are unique for any observable, I mean, they can be used, uh, I'm sorry, they, they can be used for any observable that we want to compute. Okay, now if I focus now on this touch line uh, a little bit, um, and I plot now the, uh, the points uh, taking into account also the volume, L is the spatial length of the box we are simulating as a function of the lattice spacing, I just plot it uh, as a square, you see uh, the amount of simulations and efforts uh, that are going on uh, to study uh, uh, um, properties directly at the physical point and increasing the volume. This big circle corresponds to this uh, circle here, which you see is more than 10 Fermi, is exceptional. Most collaborations stay around between five and six, and our points here in red show that uh, we are in a good way uh, to, to take the continuum limit where we need three points at least, and the infinite uh, volume limit are fixed lattice spacing as we go in this dimension. So this is the effort that is ongoing in order to reach uh, continuum physics. Okay, and I already mentioned this, the various collaborations are used uh, with some time uh, fermions, uh, various lattice spacings, and now various uh, volumes. Okay, so um, the ensembles that I will be using, as I said, are generated by the extended twist and mass collaboration. Um, and uh, if I just focus on the um, physical point, which is uh, of interest, uh, you can see explicitly here the parameters of, of the lattices. Uh, we have two volumes at the lattice spacing on 0.08 Fermi. Uh, we have, um, we are finishing the second volume uh, for a, a lattice spacing of uh, 0.07, um, and we have one volume uh, at the uh, lattice spacing of 0.06. So here we would like to generate an ensemble uh, so that we can um, study volume effects. Now, as I said, we have a problem going beyond uh, 0.05. And this is because of the critical slowing down in the hybrid Monte Carlo algorithm that we are using, uh, which generates long autocorrelations. Basically, the autocorrelation length in the simulation increases exponentially. And this is a huge problem that stops us from doing uh, these uh, simulations. And there is a lot of work now and effort uh, that has been devoted into uh, using new ideas based on machine learning and equivariant flows to sort of try and solve this problem, but we are not there yet. These are uh, preliminary ideas uh, which have shown promise 
in a theory like uh, five to the fourth in um, small dimensions. Uh, and there is um, a lot of excitement on the other, from one hand, but also a lot of work uh, that has to be done in order to be able to uh, simulate uh, lattice facility uh, for smaller lattice spacing. Okay, so this is an overview of the status. So we do have a, a success here. We have now simulations directly at the physical point. This eliminates um, a systematic effect that we always had in lattice QCD due to the chiral extrapolations. Um, and chiral perturbation theory is very good for mesons. It's not so good for baryons. And for the quantities we are talking about uh, today, this was uh, one source of uncontrolled systematic error. But now, now um, we have the simulations and we can really um, make use of this success. Uh, I told you that on, on our way to have at least three lattice spacings in order to take the continuum limit, but this would take some analysis and most actually of the computations right now at the physical point are done using one lattice spacing still, maybe two. So the continuum limit is still something we need to work out. Similarly, with the finite volume effects, typically uh, the computations are done at one lattice spacing or at one volume, excuse me, or two, but uh, we required at least three uh, to really uh, estimate the um, infinite uh, volume limit. There are other um, uncertainties that we have to deal with. And I will say a little bit more on this uh, later on, um, which are called ground state identification. And I will explain this in a moment. This creates difficulties, especially uh, when we do a calculation uh, at the physical point. We have to renormalize. Oh, you heard this from Massimo. This is a non-trivial task that we have to do. We have made tremendous progress here. Uh, we do not usually non perturbative renormalization. Um, there are complications. If you make your observables uh, more complicated, and maybe you know that apart from ultra local operators, now we also use extended operators, and the renormalization there is quite tricky. But I believe uh, that. We, we know how to do uh, a proper non perturbative renormalization for most quantities of interest, at least in this talk. Okay, and in what follows, uh, I will assume that the up and down core have equal masses and neglect in electromagnetic effects. In other words, I'm assuming isosceles symmetry. Now, there are computations where these are taken into account, the NW, the BNW collaboration, for example, has done tremendous work uh, here. So it is possible, uh, we know how to do it, it's complicated. And in what, in what I'm saying uh, from now on, I will assume uh, isospin symmetry. Okay, so now that I have set the uh, background, let me go and compute something uh, using the gauge configurations and the quark propagators that I have. And the simplest thing to calculate, of course, is the two-point function, which involves the creation of, a, um, of my uh, nucleon state, a state of not the nucleon state, actually, uh, a, a trial state uh, with the quantum numbers of the nucleon. This I create with this operator, which I call um, J bar here, acting on the vacuum, at some reference uh, point in time on the on the on the lattice, and then I evolve, I I I, I um, propagate the quarks in Euclidean time, uh, and then I annihilate this uh, uh, trial state with an annihilation operator J acting on the other side. Um, so if I do a spectral decomposition of this um, vacuum matrix element here, 
I would get a sum of exponentials uh, with, the, with energies, the states of the nucleon with certain amplitude A. Okay, and this is a term that goes from zero to infinity. Now, um, I sum over the end point, which means I take the zero momentum limit, the, the zero momentum state, states. So I have uh, uh, the zero total momentum energies of the system. And then if I allow this uh, time evolution to be large enough, the only dominant exponent will, will be the one with the smallest energy. And this will give me the mass of my nucleon. Okay, so this is how I will extract the uh, mass of the nucleon. And this is uh, a more complicated way of showing this um, in order to probe this, if I have a single exponential and divide it with a um, one time slice after, because these are pure exponentials, then I would get the mass of my nucleon. So um, the, this logarithm would give me the mass of the nucleon in lattice units plus the correction from the higher excited states that I have in this uh, tower of states. So if I plot now this um, effective mass, this so-called effective mass, uh, at the beginning, I would have contaminations from the higher excited states, and asymptotically, I will reach the mass of the nucleon. And this is an analysis uh, doing a constant feed uh, including two states, including three states, how the results vary as I increase the time that I fit. And then I search to find uh, where everything is consistent and I take this as my final value. So this is the kind of analysis when I said data analysis, this is the kind of analysis we need to do very carefully to identify the ground state. And this is what I meant in the previous slide, that ground state identification is a non-trivial procedure because you are fighting the long distance behavior with the growing exponential growth of statistical errors. And you have to do a lot of techniques uh, to be able to extract this accurately uh, with the right systematic errors. Okay, if you do that, then uh, you do get the, uh, the ground state of the nucleon. These are, we are using physical ensemble. So we do get the physical uh, nucleon mass. And then we are also getting the first excited state, which is consistent with the rover. So this is a success. Note, however, that they are scattering states, pi n states, that are lower in energy that we do not see uh, in this correlation function. And there is a good reason why we don't see them, because these are volume suppressed. There are two particle states, and they are both volume suppressed. But this is a headache. And this is something that Lattice QCD people are now trying to uh, identify and understand. In particular, their effects on more complicated quantities, not like the one I'm talking about here. So this is what I meant by the problem of ground state identification, just to um, explain. Right, now uh, I go to a more complicated quantity. I told you that actually what I want to calculate is a form factor. To calculate a form factor, I have to probe, I have to use a probe, uh, so I have to send an, uh, the photon, uh, disturb my uh, nucleon and then measure the form factor, for example. So this is a diagram that shows this. It's a non-perturbative diagram. There are a lot of exchanges of blues, quark and quarks. So this is a fully dressed quark propagator. And now I have a free point function because I do the same thing. I create here my state, I annihilate it, but then I have it uh, to my probe. And as I said, I will only be concerned about this car diagram and not this one. I will ignore, ne neglect this for this talk. So this is what I do. I want to calculate creating my state, uh, coupling it at, at an intermediate time, um, and then annihilating it. And for simplicity here, I 
don't consider momentum transfer, we will do later on. But for now, I take um, the simplest thing that I can calculate, namely uh, at zero momentum transfer. Okay, and then I do uh, a similar analysis to the one I showed you before, namely I take some ratio, like I did with the effective mass, uh, but now this is a ratio of the three-point function, which depends on my pro with a two-point function, and then in the limit that uh, this times, this time here interval, and this time, uh, time here interval goes to infinity, then I recover the metric element that I want. But again, there are contaminations, and I have to be very careful that I, I will extract the correct metric element. So there are ways to do this. I can just take a very long time and then neglect that and this and fit, fit to a constant. So this is called plateau method. Or I can take this first contamination into account and make a fit. And this is called two-state fit. If I take the third one, this is called the three-state fit. But you understand because I have noise, this gets more difficult as I include more states. So I'm very, very limited to the number of states I can include. And then there are a, 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 a little bit more complicated methods uh, where one can sum this ratio over the insertion. Uh, and then you get something which depends linearly on the time separation between where I create and annihilate. And what you see here, the nice thing about this method is, is that um, the first contamination that I get is the difference in energy between the first and lowest that goes like this whole time here, whereas in this method, it goes like this time here. So you may say that this method is approximately the Pratov method, but using twice the length of the separation. Okay, so this is a, a, an improved method. Now, the point I don't want you to, I mean, the point that I presented this is that you really have to do this analysis, get consistent results in order to uh, be sure that you have extracted the correct metric segment. Okay, now, so these are the basics. And now I will show you some results. Uh, but before I do, uh, I will ask if there are any questions uh, at this point. The yeah, there is one question by Ken. Oh, sorry, yeah. oh, hi. Um, earlier, when you were showing the pion masses, is there? I saw. I noticed a couple of groups went smaller than the actual pion mass. You, you yes. it, what's the motivation uh, behind that? Uh, yes, uh, particularly the BMW. Yes. Oh, and uh, and the downward trend. Yeah, BMW as well. Yeah. Uh, BMW. So and. Uh, uh, what is this? Yeah, the W. Um, yes, they went there because they wanted to see how the chiral limit is approached. You see, you don't see many of them. It's only the BW collaboration uh, which has, has done that. But you know, uh, in the in, in language, we can you know use the mass and we can ask uh, how is chiral perturbation theory validated, for example. Right, so we do have this flexibility, um, and and the the BW collaboration has done this, but of course uh, this gets harder and harder and harder. Okay, so you don't see many points below below this line. Does this answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Let me go then to some results. Okay, so let me convince you that we know how to do the analysis by showing you some results. So these are th the three lattice basics that we have that I told you about at a physical pile of mass. Okay, and this is the analysis we do. This is the ratio. This are, are, are Q squared equals zero. This particular observable is the tensor charge of the nucleon. And you see as we vary this time separation, we get lower and lower. So if we fit uh, to a constant, we get these points that gradually approach asymptotes. Okay, 
Now here, what I'm showing you this red point is if you do a two-state fit, if I include the first excited state, and this is the points I get, if I do three-state fits, and if I do the summation fit. And only when all these agree, I take my final result. And you see, this is different from what uh, I would have taken if I have assumed convergence. And you see, this is very tricky because it's not like the math that is asymptotic. This is not asymptotic. So you have to really do a very careful analysis. And you have to keep the errors as you increase the separation constant. This means that you need to do a lot of simulations. Actually, I thought I had the statistics. Yeah, here, sorry. So um, you see, as I increase in separation from A to 20, um, th this is in physical units. So I go from 0.6 to 1.6. I really have to increase the statistics to keep the arrow peaks. So this point here, it's very expensive. So the two, actually the two last points are as expensive as, the, as on the previous ones. So I need to do 15 million inversions in order to produce this graph. Now I do, I mean, of course, this is the same analysis I do for the other ensemble and you see I gave the convergence and this is ongoing. You see, I don't have all the curves here because the last three uh, are still ongoing. I have not reached the statistics that are named for. But you see the number of inversions I have to do, these are huge calculations that I have to do to really extract reliably uh, the metric seven. And for this quantity, uh, we have done the, the work. And now I can use these uh, results to extrapolate to the continuum limit directly at, at the physical time mass, keeping the, uh, the mass fixed at its physical value. This is extremely important. This is the first result that is doing this. You see other lattice uh, results. These are lattice results, but all of these use chiral extrapolations, okay? But you see a very good agreement and you see the comparison with the phenomenology. And I, I hope I'm convincing you that we are reading the precision error of lattice QCD, getting very accurate results more accurate actually than phenomenology with, I believe, for this quantity uh, control systematics. Okay, now this was uh, Q squared equals zero. Now, in order to extract the dipole moment, I will have to go to finite Q squared, as we will see in a, a moment. So, how about uh, computing actual form factors? And this is just in generalization. I have to compute now the three point function with momentum transfer. This I can do. And these are the results for a single ensemble now. Uh, I haven't taken the continuum limit. So this is not the final result. But you see the kind of accuracy we can achieve, for example, for the electric uh, form factor. Uh, of the um, proton and the uh, magnetic form factor of the proton. And this actually include the so-called disconnected diagrams, which I don't have time to discuss here how we compute them. They are much more difficult than the connected diagram for technical reasons, but we are now able to compute uh, this quantity. So what you see here is really the full contribution. And you see a very nice agreement apart from the uh, low Q squared here with experimental data and here at the tail. As I said, we have to take the continuum limit. We have to estimate the infinite uh, volume limit. Um, but however, if I go down to the neutron, you see the kind of uh, accuracy uh, uh, lattice QCD results achieve compared to experiment. I think this is impressive. And it will only get better because the machines get better and our algorithms get better. So this is what I call precision error of lattice QCD. Um, here I'm showing you the disconnected contributions. These are the complete disconnected contributions. Uh, you see, this is the effect of the strange curve. 
uh, on the electric and magnetic, uh, and you see it's clearly non zero. Uh, we have a clearly non zero uh, um, contribution. And this is actually a very nice demonstration of C quark effects on the form factors. And of course, this has impact on what is going on in experiments. Uh, for example, if you look at all the circles, uh, you can put limits on what these uh, strange uh, form factors uh, um, need to be. And you see that elasticity constrains this very accurately. So this is the kind of, 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 of result uh, benefit uh, phenomenology and experiment. Okay, now I will come to the topic, which is a, a neutron electric type of moment, where the motivation I don't think I need to say for this audience. Um, it's pretty uh, obvious why you are doing this. Um, uh, and uh, there is an experimental limit. I don't know if the latest, uh, but it's a very stringent one. And there are a lot of uh, there is a lot of other experimental efforts uh, going on uh, to improve this uh, upper bound by two orders uh, of magnitude. Now there is uh, in uh, nature uh, the the electron weak sector. Um, uh, uh, where um, to a phase in the quark mass, uh, there is a limit on the uh, neutral electric dipole moment. And, but I will be talking about the strong sector um, where if I add a, a Chen Simon's term which breaks CP, then um, I can generate um, a, a neutron uh, 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 electric dipole moment. And you have seen this from Massimo's talk. Uh, this is a topological, the integral of Q over X is a topological charge. And this is the continuum definition of, of, of this topological charge. So um, the general approach is, okay, I have my lattice QCD Lagrangian which is invariant under CP and T transformations. And this cannot introduce an own vanishing, vanishing um, um, EDM. However, if I do add the CP violating Chen Simon's term to the Lagrangian, this term here, then this of course will generate an on zero uh, dipole moment, electric dipole moment. So what is our approach uh, to compute now this expectation value that I had before, right, in the path integral. But now, as Massimo did, I add this topological uh, term here, which makes my weight um, in, uh, complex. And this is a huge problem because we cannot do hybrid Monte Carlo with such a complex weight. So uh, this is the sign problem, as we already mentioned it, and there are various techniques how to deal with it uh, on the lattice. Um, one is to measure the neutron energy in an external electric field. Uh, so uh, the mass, uh, the shift in the masses, uh, if you have an external electric field. Uh, one is to simulate with imaginary theta, so we consider Massimo already mentioned this, we rotate to imaginary theta, uh, and this presumably uh, will be reported uh, by Gary later on in the week. Uh, so QCDSF has used this approach. What we do is to consider that since theta is small, we expand this um, Feynman path integral to leading order and to leading order, I can compute these expectation values using the same ensembles as I already showed you. So compute this expectation value. This is a standard thing that I already showed you, the form factor that I already showed you. But a new ingredient comes in now because I have to calculate the same operator correlated with the topological charge. 
And this is the difficulty because as Massimo explained, this is going to be noisy because the topological charge is basically Gaussian around zero. Okay, so this is the name of the game now. And this is not at the same level of precision as the previous calculations I was talking about. But this is the approach uh, uh, we are going to take in order to compute um, uh, the uh, electric dipole. So uh, uh, if you expand now, and I will come back to it, uh, the nuclear metrics element, the electromagnetic nuclear metrics element, you will get a CP violating whole factor in addition to the two under the or dimension, which is called a three, uh, which depends on Q squared, and you need the uh, Q squared limit of this form factor to relate it to the uh, neutron electric type of moment via this relation. So this is what I, I, I have to do, like I did for the electromagnetic form factors, but uh, I can only calculate this at, at three at finite Q squared because of zero Q square, I cannot extract it from the metric, metric element, and then somehow take the limit as Q square goes to zero, like I like for the uh, magnetic uh, form factor. Okay, so this is the procedure. And now this is the expansion. If I um, uh, consider the metric element of the nucleon in the presence of a theta term, uh, so the metric element of the electromagnetic uh, current, I can decompose it in these three compactors, the Pauli and Dirac compactors that I know, and this new one, the F3. And if I expand now this F3 to living order and neglect higher orders, then I can do uh, the computation. So again, we have to, because this is a metric element, I have to compute the three point function in the presence of the theta. What do I do? Well, uh, I write it in this way. It doesn't matter uh, that the, I mean, um, uh, Massimo already explained, fortunately, this uh, phase that comes from the quarks. And I have to calculate this alpha in order to compute now this matrix element. And if I expand now this exponent here uh, in terms of theta, then I compute this, which I already done. And then I compute this new matrix element, which is a three point function correlated with the topological charge to extract what I want. Now, how do I compute this alpha parameter? Well, to determine the alpha parameter, I compute the two-point function without the topological charge and the two-point function correlated with the topological charge. And the ratio asymptotically will give me alpha to leading order. So this is the kind of diagram. I mean, diagrammatically, this is this two-point function is um, the correlation of Q with um, with the um, neutron. Okay, the, uh, the analysis to extract the, um, um, the matrix element is very similar to what uh, we, uh, we've seen before. I make this ratio. Now, because I have finite Q, there is a comp uh, another, uh, something here that depends on the two point function. It doesn't matter what it is, the analysis is the same. It's just some combination of two, uh, two point functions. And if I expand now, for example, a certain indices of this ratio, then I can identify uh, F3 at the binary Q square. You see there's a Q, Q here, so that's why I cannot get it uh, at zero uh, momentum transfer. Okay, so this is what I have to do. Now, Massimo, uh, uh, elaborated a lot, so I, uh, I, I don't have to say very much here. But uh, the topological charge enters, and therefore I have to compute it within lattice QCD. And uh, Massimo already mentioned all the compli uh, complications of the discretization. We can use a field theoretic definition, uh, or we can use uh, a fermionic definition uh, using spectral projections. Uh, this has shown by Christian uh, Lusher. 
uh, that if I use the lower lowest modes of the um, square Dirac operator, then I, I can express a topological charge in terms of these lower moment, uh, lower uh, modes. And I should check that in the continuum limit, uh, these two definitions are in equivalent. Yeah, they lead to the same result. So I, I will go uh, um, somewhat fast here. So this is the um, uh, fermionic, uh, the field theoretic definition. I discretize this um, field tensor here uses some kind of discretization that we know. Uh, we, we do a smoothing of the ultraviolet fluctuations and we use a gradient flow here because this has a nitro normalization properties already Massimo mentioned this. So this is what we use. It doesn't matter. We solve this equation and we do that. Um, and then we, as a second method, uh, we try to improve our signal signal. And I will explain to you why by using this uh, expansion in terms of the lowest uh, modes of the Dirac, of the square of the Dirac operator. And you see this, these terms here, these are the renormalization factors that we have to put in uh, so that this quantity is renormalized. And we sum over the lowest modes up to a cutoff M. And we vary this M to see that everything is okay. Okay, this is how we do the topological charge. And this is the result. Uh, so I'm showing you the uh, susceptibility here. I think this should have been to the core. So uh, uh, as a function of uh, A square, oops, excuse me. And you see this is the um, P theoretic definition as, a, as I go to the continuum limit. And these are the various uh, spectral uh, projection definitions varying this cutoff. And you see the continuum limit, they all agree. So this is a check, but no, the cutoff effects are very different. So these have very, very mild cutoff effects. So this is important because we will do the calculation at a given lab spacing for this, for this work. And you see, uh, in the continuum limit, it doesn't matter what the cutoff is, really. Uh, and uh, the variation, I mean, here, for example, uh, the variation is very small. So this is good news. Right, so just to give you an impression, these are the fluctuations of the topological charge when we use the field theoretic definition as compared to the spectral projection definition. And the red, you see, it shows less fluctuation. And this is why we use it. You can see it also here from the distribution, from the Gaussian uh, distribution, more narrow. So we expected our statistical errors to improve. And indeed, if you compute the susceptibility of the square of the topological charge, uh, you see reduced errors. Okay, these numbers would only agree in the continuum limit. This is at the fixed lattice spacing. Okay, so now uh, I show you the determination of this uh, parameter, this uh, mixing angle alpha using this one ensemble at the physical point. I take the ratio, here is the ratio, I take the large limit, and from the plateau, I uh, compute. Uh, the value. This is the field theoretic, the same for the spectral projection. Okay. I, for the form factor, I do the analysis. Here it's um, for a particular Q square value. I think this is the lowest. At a particular time separation. Uh, and this is the value I get uh, for the form factor. And then I have to take the uh, Q square going to zero. And these are the results. So Practically for log Q squared, it's, uh, it's, I don't see any strong variation. So we take, I mean, these results do not allow for anything else than a fit to a constant to extract uh, this uh, uh, zero um, momentum transfer form factor. And this is my final slide where I show you uh, now um, a collection of uh, 
data uh, and you see most computations up to now were done for higher than physical final masses. This point, this our result, this red point here, and, and uh, you see that really, we really have improved by an order of magnitude zero. However, this is still consistent with zero and far away from the experimental accuracy, of course. So um, let me conclude. So using the spectral projections, we improved our signal compared to the field theoretic approach by a factor of two. This is the value we obtain, consistent with zero, but not with the precision that uh, we would like to. I mean, the, the error is really um, behind the, the result. Um, now, this highlights the difficulty, in my opinion, in order to really calculate this uh, to the accuracy required, we will need two orders of magnitude increased statistics if we stay with the same approach. Now, of course, I said there are alternative approaches. Maybe you will hear um, in this conference, uh, but I believe all approaches uh, will have similar issues. Now, Europe and the United States and China and, and Japan are installing exascale computers. This will increase our computational power by almost two orders of magnitude. So all two orders of magnitude computational power, we are almost there. So this is very good news. But I believe we also knew uh, it would be good to also have new ideas uh, that would allow us to uh, improve um, the way the calculation of this quantity. So uh, with this, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and thank also uh, my collaboration. Uh, this is an old picture, but I still like it. We all look very young here. Uh, of the uh, number of people uh, involved in order that we could, we can now compute this kind of quantities. Thank you for, thank you very much. Well, thanks, Tina, for this great presentation. So questions? Thank you for the nice talk. I have a couple of questions, maybe I ask one. Uh, so first of all, a comment, I think for theta, for the theta term, it might be very useful that you also show calculation at different pion masses, just to check the chiral behavior of, of your results, right? You expect well, the, this- this is here, this is in this plot, right? Different masses. No, but you guys only did one calculation, right? At physical? No, no, we have done another one at heavier than, we didn't go straight to the, uh, to the physical point. This was our previous ah, result. that's yours, uh, okay, heavier. okay. No, okay. No, we, we, we wouldn't do that. I mean, okay, very good. <laughs> and then, <laughs> I mean, I, I collaborate with the Los Alamos people. I think part of our big errors that you show here is due to uh, very large excited state uh, contamination that we seem to see. Do you see anything similar in your calculation? No, not with the accuracy that we have. And this is a problem, not with the accuracy that we have. Within the accuracy that we have, we do not see. We, we check, but you see, we only went to time separation 12, whereas in the preview result that I showed you, we went to time separation 20, okay? This is not possible here because of the errors. So that's why I, I, I'm saying in order to really calculate this with, with similar precision to what we do with um, the, the tensor chart, you need to at least two orders of magnitude more statistics, at least. So uh, within our statistics and um, comparing 8, 10, and 12, we did not see, uh, um, I mean, we see consistency. But that's all I can say uh, regarding the uh, contaminations. Elaboration on which excited states did you specifically I didn't hear it. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So we see a very large contamination from the nucleon pion because in this particular case, the volume suppression that Tina was talking about seems not to be there. 
Yeah, this is a very big uh, puzzle, and I think we, we really need to have a discussion because you are not seeing the rover. You are seeing the first excited state that you have in your two-plane function is very high. We see the rover, which is much lower than you. So you see these huge effects because already in the two-point function, you have a, a first excited state that is very high, I think. But this is a discussion we have to have uh, in the largest community and understand this. I think, I think at the moment, this is not understood uh, completely. This is my point of view. So what you see, for example, in the axial form factors, we don't see. We see uh, different behaviors as we go to uh, the continuum limit. And then the PCAC is the result in the continuum limit uh, and uh, everything is okay. But we, we see a different behavior uh, to compare, uh, compare to you. We see smaller effects when we let the, ma the, the, the first excited state in the three point function, uh, function three as compared to you. Okay, so uh, so it, it, there are different aspects. I don't know if this answers your question. Okay, more questions? Okay. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, your fitting procedures for multi-state fits. Um, have you considered um, using some Bayesian analysis in there instead of just choosing oh, we did, we one did. that works. We did. Yeah. Uh, we did. And try to like take an average or sort of have some model yeah, selection we did. thing. We did. I, I think to use this approach, you need very accurate results. So for, for example, for GT, one could try and do that. I think there we have uh, enough accurate results. Uh, but for the, for the electric cycle moment, I doubt it. Okay, thanks. This is my uh, my experience at the moment, maybe. Yeah, because it seemed that you know you, you were just choosing one point, uh, for example, for the masses or you know for the first excited state. Well, it's not it's not a, it's not a, no no it's not a one point it's not a it's many many points it's a lot of analysis it's not no no I, I meant in in like the before um in the previous plots i think it was um yeah. yeah no no for the like when you were showing for example two point functions and things like those um oh uh, wait a minute yeah oh, the, yeah, those, yeah. Our, yeah no this is a very elaborate analysis i don't know i don't think anybody else does this well, this is a uh, this is the a constant fit varying uh, the, the, the yes the, yes and uh, this is a two state fit this is a three state fit yeah I and, mean th there are there are ways to basically combine all those fits with different fitting windows and and choosing yeah, an un, an unbiased yeah, here, version I, I'm not, here you can do it here yeah. you, here uh, the results are accurate enough. To do this method, but I don't think we find anything else, anything, anything new here. Okay. Yeah. But for the neutral dipole moment, I think you need you need to get to an accuracy that we don't have at the moment. Yeah, please. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Hi, yes. I have I have two questions. Um my first one is about your plot of the um of F3, but the two different definitions of the topological charge. Um, let me get there. This one? Uh mm, F3. Uh, no. uh, F3, sorry, F3, yes. Sorry. Here, yes. Uh, I believe. Uh, uh, Before? After, Before? I think. This one? Mm -hmm. uh, no, keep going. No, F3. 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 Where? Here. You had two plots of F3, one for the. 
Ah, um, F3, yes. not the topological chart, sorry. F3 here, I know, uh, waiting here. Uh, okay. Yes, yes. So my my first question is, um, do you believe that the difference in in sign at low Q squared uh, between the two methods is uh, just uh, uh, consistent with errors, or do you think there's a, yeah, a qualitative it's reason? With it's consistent okay. with errors. You cannot say anything at yeah. the moment. Yeah. Okay. And my other question is, uh, uh, I just wanted to ask. Your correlation of the with the topological charge. Are you using just the the global topological charge, or are you using a topological charge density? Uh, the topological charge it's not divided by the volume. That's what you mean. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was asking. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. No more questions. Not, not okay, Ken. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I know I'm in the way of people eating lunch. Um, this is more of the magnetic moment of the neutron. I think you did some, you compared experiment and your theory as a function of uh, energy transfer. I just want to ask uh, for that, where does the experimental data come from? And uh, where, where is the neutron uh, magnetic polarizability? I believe, is that the, is that the zero? Q squared limit of this? And yeah, how's the data? Okay. Uh, I mean, this is a collection of experiments, so I'm afraid I cannot give you the exact references. But if you go in this article, you would find all the references. Okay. And for readability, okay, we cannot extract the proper readability uh, here. I mean, um, I haven't talked about the probability, right? I mean, there are various methods to extract the probability. If I if I understood correctly your question. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was, yeah, that was. I'm oh, interested yeah. in the polarizability, oh, experimental, lot, and what you can do. Okay. So there's one ah, question by you. I just have a comment. I think the magnetic form factor. I mean, the magnetic moment is much more precisely known than shown in this figure. I mean, it's known to five. So the value of the form factor at zero is a magnetic moment. That's certainly known to much higher precision than shown on this figure. I mean, the, but this is a spread of results. So no, no, but come on, the magnetic it's moment a, of the photon is known. It's a history, if you like. It's not one point, right? The magnetic moment is one point. I mean, what you have is form factors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The magnetic but, uh, moment is one okay, point. Uh, Maybe I should uh, not uh, show history, but anyway, yeah, I, I agree with you. You're absolutely but right. The same holds, <laughs> by the way, for the neutron. There's also a point at zero, which is not even on your scale, minus 1.81. Sorry? Ah, uh, because the same it's below for the my magnetic scale. Of the it's neutron. below my scale. Okay, it's below yes. my scale. But you see a point which is very accurate there, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but the point is that at zero, I mean, there's this crucial normalization, which is a magnetic moment, which you should also try to get. So you're, yeah, you're yeah, missing some, uh, you're missing at low Q square, you're missing some physics in the. Exactly. In the I'm saying, I, I, I said this at low Q square. There is an issue that draws Q square from GN for both the proton and the neutron. It's correct. So this is what we need to understand. Is it uh, continuum extrapolation? Is it finite volume? Is it uh, contamination of uh, pi n? This, this is still open, right? Yeah, anyway, so that I'm only amazed because you, the charge you seem to get exactly, there's a the moment what? there's something. Which? The, the, the charge you get exactly, which is 1.00. Well, but that's, uh, no, no, but that's a symmetry, right? Because we okay, use that's a water card. density. Yeah, okay, that's water. No, this is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is a symmetry. You have to get yeah, one, okay. otherwise. <laughs> okay, thanks. So are there more questions? So I guess everyone is hungry. So, so Dina, thanks a lot for the I mean, great presentation. I enjoyed it. Have a nice time. <laughs>